Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another strength materials problem. And this problem is going to be dealing with principal strains and maximum shearing strain, which is something we haven't necessarily covered yet, but we have a lot of videos that are going to help us to explain uh, what's going on with a problem like this. So the problem that we're going to be solving today is as follows. The strain components at a point in a body are normal strain X equals to positive 1200. And we remember that it is unit unitless, but we're considering the 10 to the negative 6 power for micro. Similarly, we have epsilon y or normal strain y equals to negative 600, and the shearing strain xy is plus 900 uh, micro radians. So it's asking us to determine the principal strains and the maximum shearing strain at the point and show the principal strain deformations and the maximum shearing strain deformation uh, on a sketch. So in order to explain this, we're going to be looking at some theory quickly. So I'm just going to switch over to a slide here. Uh, and we're going to go through this very quickly. So in our previous video, we talked about principal stress and maximum shearing stress. And this uh, concept was pretty simple. We defined planes where we had zero shear stress acting on it as principal planes. And the normal stresses that were acting on these planes were called principal stresses. So if you looked at this element here, given a certain orientation, you would get to a point where you have a maximum normal stress acting on a face where the shear stress is zero. All right. So we derived equa equations to determine the orientation uh, where this principal plane would be developed using this one here. And we also determined how principal stresses are going to be acting on that plane. We then looked into the concept of max in plane shearing stress, which is taking a 45 degree uh, angle from that theta p that we already had and determining what the shearing stress would be on that inclined face for a max in plane shearing stress. And then we later looked into max shear stress considering sigma p3 or your third principal stress because we know for principal stresses, zero has to be acting as one of these stresses. So if we consider different orientations for that triangular element we were analyzing, we could actually determine an absolute value for the max shear stress that could develop on this inclined face. Now, we have done uh, a lot of derivation to get to this point for shear stress and principal stress. Going over to principal strain, it's really taking what we already know and deriving new equations to put it in terms of strain. It's actually pretty simple. What it does, it, it considers uh, our principal stresses and replaces them with normal strains. Then we're also looking at replacing our shearing stress with our shearing strain, which was that shearing strain over two because you had the two angles comprising uh, of that size change based on the xy plane. And what defines a principal plane in terms of strain is there's going to be zero shearing strain. That means that the angle or the size change of this element is going to be non-existent for a given orientation based on this alpha p. So what does this mean? We have principal strains that are acting normal to the, the, uh, the principal planes that we are solving for. And similarly, we have equations where we can determine these values of the strains acting on these principal planes. So once again, epsilon P1 or normal strain P1 and P2 representing the X and the Y respectively. And then we share the similar relationship where we have the uh, cumulative addition of both strains is going to equal to the cumulative addition of the principal strains. Then looking into the max in plane shearing strain, we have a very similar concept. We're going to see this in the problem, but we actually have a 45 degree difference between where this alpha P is going to be and where this alpha for the shearing strain or the max in plane shearing strain is going to be. So we have derived equations that are going to be useful for solving all of the important values of strain. Once again, why are these values important? They're important because the most critical and max values of strain 
are going to influence whether our shape can handle it. So let's say we had a uh, type of metal. If you go past a certain amount of strain, it will go from being uh, elastic into being a point where it cannot recover from that deformation, turning into plastic, right? And once, last again, we have the max shearing strain, similar to the max shearing stress, we are considering the third dimension where we consider that normal strain will be zero in one of these orientations. So using different formulas, considering which strains are acting on our element, we can actually derive for the absolute max shearing strain. So let's carry these equations over to the problem and see what we're dealing with. All right, so now we can hop into the problem and let's just take a look at the element quickly before we hop in. We can see what's happening based on the given variables. We have a slight elongation based on the normal strain X, slight compression based on the normal strain Y, and we have a reduction in this angle being created between X, Y based on that shearing strain X, Y. So the first thing we need to do is visualize the orientation that this element is going to take to develop uh, principal planes in terms of strain. So how are we going to do this? We can use this equation up here to determine the angle of theta p, which is going to be from x to that new axis where this element is going to be resting, where it generates those strains. So let's write it down. We have tan 2 alpha p is going to equal to the shearing strain x, y over normal strain x minus normal strain y. And if we isolate for this alpha p, you're going to be left with 1 half for this 2, the tan inverse for tan. And we are simply plugging in the variables that we have. So shear xy is given as positive 900. All of our units are in the same micro. So we don't need to do any conversions. And we have epsilon x minus epsilon y, which is a negative value. So we're doing minus, minus 600. Solving for alpha p, we will be left with 13.28 degrees. And we're left with a positive value, meaning that we are going counterclockwise from x. So let's visualize what this looks like uh, for our element. All right, so now we have the new orientation for our stress element. We can see that we have a new coordinate system to consider, which is very similar to our previous video on, on strain transformations, where we're looking at n and t respectively. But now we have that e t or epsilon t or normal strain t is going to equal to your principal strain 2, and your normal strain with respect to n is going to be your principal strain 1. What the heck does this mean? This means that there is no shear strain developed. There is only strain values uh, with respect to the normals here. And we can go ahead and solve for what these maximum values are going to be. And we have equations to do this. So let me just put that right there. Uh, let's solve first for epsilon P1 or normal strain P1, which is with, with respect to the n direction. So it's pretty much just plugging in the values that we already know. So you have 1,200 plus, and then we have that minus 600. And we divide that by 2. And for P1, we are adding. And we're going to take the root. Hopefully I can squeeze this all in here. 1,200 minus negative 600. All divided by 2. That is squared. And then we're considering the shearing strain initially, which is the 900 over 2, and that is squared as well. And epsilon P1 is going to equal to 1,306 micro. And this could be in meters per meter, if you want to think about it like that. Now, as we know, uh, I just skipped ahead and filled in the equation. The only thing that's changing for the normal strain P2 is that we are going to be considering a negative instead of a positive between that uh, square root function. So that is going to leave you with normal strain P2 equal to negative 706. 
and we're recalling also that our normal strain P3, or with respect to uh, the axis coming out of the page, is going to equal to zero. And that gives you your final values for the principal strains. Now, similarly, we have to consider where our max in-plane shearing strain is going to act as well. So we're using this other equation to determine that alpha shearing. Uh, and it's a very similar thing where we're taking that tan to alpha shearing, which is equal to the negative of epsilon x initially given minus the epsilon y over the shearing strain xy. And it's a very similar solving process where we are determining that angle by taking one half. This will now be negative due to this sign though. And we're taking the tan inverse of what is given to us. So what's given to us, we have the 1200 minus the negative 600. And we are dividing that by the 900 shearing strain, which is going to equal a value of negative 31.72 degrees. Or if we wanted to consider this as a positive angle, we would add 90 to it in this case, which would be equivalent to 58. To nine degrees. If you notice between these two angles, uh, they both have a difference of 45 degrees between them, which is something we discussed a little bit earlier in this video. So let's plot what this orientation of the element is going to look like now that we have solved for this angle. All right, now that we have the max shearing strain distortion uh, plotted in the sketch here, we can go ahead and take a look at what the values are that we're looking for. So we can first consider the max in plane shearing strain which is going to simply equal to epsilon p1 minus epsilon p2. And we remember what these values are. We had 1306 for normal strain uh, principle p1. And then we had the negative 700 for normal strain p2. And solving that, you're going to be left with 212 micro radians. Then we can take a look at our conventions that we have for determining the max shearing strain. And we notice that we have a positive and a negative principal strain for P1 and P2. Thus meaning that the first condition is the one we're gonna be looking at to develop that max shearing strain. And we can see that it's the exact same formula. So for our case, max in plane is going to equal to the absolute max shearing strain, which will equal 2012 micro radians. But does the sign check out for this, uh, this calculation? We need to determine if the uh, value of the shearing strain is going to be positive or negative, And we can do so by considering the same formulas that we've looked at before for the shearing strain of NT. And what did that formula look like? We had negative epsilon x minus epsilon y sine to theta n plus shearing stress shearing strain sorry x y cos to theta n and what was this theta n this theta n represented the distance or the angle between x and n so let's plug in this 58.29 and see if we get a positive or a negative sign for this value And the final shearing strain that we determine is actually negative 2012 microradians. Thus meaning that we're going to have an increase in the angle developed between N and T, which is different from the sign that we actually calculated based on max in plane and the absolute max. Therefore, we can confidently say that this angle will be pi over two minus minus, which is going to result in a positive 212, and this would be microradians.